I want to welcome you to our uh, fall 2019 webinar series, Board Recruitment Best Practices, How to Recruit the Ideal Board Member Matrix of Skills, Competencies, and Personal Attributes. Uh, if you haven't already, just make sure that your uh, devices are set to uh, mute and that your webcams are off. Dennis will be taking questions at the end of the program and you can post your questions by clicking on the chat icon. Um, also know that we will be circulating a recording of the webinar to you after um, so that you will have uh, slides as well. This is especially important because I see several of you are joining by phone. For those of you who aren't familiar with Dennis and his work, he is a nationally uh, regarded nonprofit leadership coach. He has advised hundreds of organizations throughout the country on how to become their best selves, how to become high performing and to unlock the potential uh, that, that they already have within them. Um, he is an expert in board government, governance, leadership development, strategic planning, and philanthropy. And um, he is in high demand for motivational speaking, retreat facilitation, leadership coaching, and executive search in the nonprofit sector. So I am going to uh, get Dennis on the line. Dennis, are you there? Hey, Michelle, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everybody. I, I appreciate all that. Welcome aboard here. Um, so uh, board recruitment is an important topic to all of us and to all of you. And uh, obviously how to uh, go about recruitment maybe in a different way than you have is an important uh, thing for you to, to know and learn. And obviously highly performing boards um, focus on high best practices of board recruitment. So we want to put this in the context that um, how, to, how to recruit board members is just an integral part of being a high performing board. So the first thing I want to talk about with you is where within the board should the issue and discussion of board recruitment and we're also going to focus on reappointment take place. Now many of you have either a nominating committee or many of you may have a board development committee. Um, kind of give a little bit of uh, I guess 35 years um, I think the governance committee is perhaps the most important committee of a nonprofit board um, the governance committee has no power to itself uh, it's not like an executive committee to make decisions on the board it works reports back to the board as many of you know, traditionally nonprofit boards had nominating committees to recruit and recommend new board members and new board officers. So it was a nominating committee. The term nominating implies a primary responsibility for recruiting and basically nominating officers. Over time, boards realized that educating new and current board members on a wide array of topics was also important throughout the term of the board members. Discovering that everyone benefited from education, not just new members, this committee's name evolved into a board development committee. However, that name often became confused with the development committee charged with fundraising and philanthropy initiatives. Thus, the more newly adopted term for board recruitment and development is the governance committee. You see on your screen here, the governance committee has a, a number of key responsibilities certainly to periodically review and update the roles and responsibilities of the board and as a whole, as well as individual board members. Uh, certainly uh, assess the current and future board composition requirements, which we're gonna talk about how to do that today and develop a board profile, identify potential new board members and nominate new individuals and reappoint people. We're gonna talk about that today. The governance committee should also be the place where the board um, its own effectiveness is, is, is assessed and measured on an annual basis. Certainly, it's, a, it's the committee that should periodically review and update board practices and policies, uh, particularly the bylaws. Uh, it's amazing to me um, how many organizations have not looked in their bylaws since the last time they were adopted or amended. And um, uh, the committee also, governance committee, should be assuring chief executive and board succession planning. 
Um, we talked about officers. I also think the governance committee, though some of you may use it as an executive committee, the governance committee should plan and schedule board retreats. And last but not least, should provide ongoing education to all board members on, a, on an important governance issues. So that's the sort of the governance committee here. Let's uh, move on here. So the one thing that, that I want to highlight today is what are the best practices that I've seen that I have worked with um, that I advise my clients on in terms of recruiting everybody and all every one of us uh, and all of you you know rely upon highly effective uh, board members here okay um, I know there's some questions that are coming up we'll get to them a little bit later here so normally what we do is we start to think about on our board, what are the skills that we need? Uh, do we need a CPA? Do we need a lawyer? Do we need a teacher? Do we need a nurse? Uh, they're all important factors. Uh, also important factors are things like geographical um, diversity. We, if we are a national organization, we don't want everybody certainly from one town. If we're a state organization, we don't want everybody from the northern part of the state. And we certainly want gender uh and a lot of different diversities racial diversities etc but what i want to emphasize today is this i want you to think about developing an ideal board matrix that would describe the ideal personal characteristics and attributes of your ideal board if you were to create it today so take a moment and think about if you were building a board today and had nobody on it yet, what would be the personal attributes that you would want? And I'm highlighting a couple here. And we will get to whether you, you know, you don't want everybody who's a lawyer or a CPA, I understand that. But the first thing I want you to think about is the attributes. So an example here, most people would want someone who's an inspirational leader on their board. Uh, in, a, in a previous webinar we did, we did one on board leadership succession, and certainly the challenge of getting someone to want to step up to the plate to take on the role of the board chair or board president. Um, it's amazing then how many people don't recruit for leadership and wonder why nobody's stepping up. So leadership is usually very important. Uh, another pot potential attribute would be someone who's an innovative strategic thinker. Uh, how about someone who is a recognize brand identity, someone who's well respected in the community, who's well thought of. How about someone who has access to influence and wealth? I'm not a big believer in putting elected officials on your board only because if they're not reelected, um, you're stuck sometimes in the wrong political situation. Uh, but how about having a um, uh, someone who's a, who's a good decision maker? How about a collaborator, someone that's a collaborative thinker? How about someone who is technologically savvy? How about someone also that uh, would be a change agent? I mean, we all know that the sector faces constant challenges and opportunities, uh, regardless of whether you're a standalone nonprofit or you're a national trade or association, but change is important. And I certainly mentioned racial, gender, and sexual diversity, and certainly passion. So those are some examples of what I'd like you to think about in terms of your ideal matrix move on now once we have that okay now again personal characteristics or attributes are not the same thing as skills like a cpa and md attorney professional social worker they are important but i want you to focus on personal characteristics first next okay if you create this matrix of ideal characteristics I want you to do the following. I want you to assess your own board's current attributes and characteristics. And the gap between number one and the gap and number two should be your priority for recruitment. So an example here, if you have your ideal board and your current board, and there's two things that are maybe missing or the gap is a strategic thinker and a, uh, and, a, and a change agent. Let's assume that. Let's assume you have leadership and everything else there, so you want a strategic thinker and a, and a brand builder. Um, next step. What you want to then do is 
is begin to discuss with your fellow board members and other stakeholders, people in the community, people in the business community, in the chamber world, uh, your donors, et cetera. Who do they know that has that is considered a strategic thinker? Who do they know that would be considered a change agent in the community? Uh, and begin to develop some names of people that have those characteristics. You are not yet uh, identifying and you are not yet contacting anybody. Now that's usually a little different than you've done in the past where you focus in on the skill sets. And we're gonna come back to that. But at this stage of the game, we're working to identify what gaps do you have in personal characteristics? The reason for that is I find that organizations that, that have a highly performing board have high level of, of characteristics that move organizations forward. And the one thing I think that all of us know is that the role of the board, besides everything else of the fiduciary responsibilities and strategic and business advice, the role of our board should be to help our organization reach our full potential. And therefore you want partners who have those competencies and skills to do that. Next, once you start to identify, no, I'm sorry, move back for a second, I'm sorry. Once you start to um, identify um, potential names, now you want to begin step four of kind of ranking them. So let's assume it for an example here. Uh, again, just as an example here, we have uh, a real need for a strategic thinker. Um, but now we notice that we don't have anybody with a financial background on our board. Or we don't have anybody who's technologically savvy, or we don't have anybody who's knowledgeable about social media. Um, and so we might say, all right, we now have identified uh, candidate A, B, and C that are all strategic thinkers, but now we want to look at what their skills are. So skills will become secondary. And then we say, listen, you know, if we have already of a, of a 12 person board, we already have three CPAs, we may not need another one, but we certainly want the one that has the, uh, perhaps the social media or the technological background. Once you then have step four done where you've ranked people First, based upon this, the gap in skills, competencies, and characteristics and attributes, only then do you begin to uh, invite those people in to and have discussion, whether it initiates with your CEO, which I want to talk about, or your chair of your governance committee or your board chair, whoever you decide is going to be the point person on this, begin to contact them about talking to them about potentially becoming a member and having an interest in your organization. I believe that the CEO plays a major role in board development. Uh, he or she is usually the face of the organization. Uh, I understand fully, having been a CEO for many years um, in the medical center business field where I was a CEO of two hospitals or medical centers that um, the CEO certainly works for the board and is hired and fired by the board, but the CEO should be playing a role in conjunction with the board in developing your board. Clearly, the CEO should not be appointing people onto the board to, that are just his or her friends and sort of protect them here, but the CEO plays a role in that. All right, let's uh, move on now. So we say nominating individuals who are acquainted with current board members is fully appropriate and encouraged. It's absolutely nice to have people that you know, that you trust, that you're comfortable with on your board. However, the ideal board consists of individuals who are first and foremost recruited based upon agreed upon criteria of needed personal characteristics or attributes, then followed by professional skills. Next. Now, before we get to the topic of board reappointment, it is also important that recruitment of board members is not an isolated issue. Uh, we talk about this in, in our course, uh, how to become a high performing board that you also want to need to make your organization attractive for people to want to serve on it. Just as there's fierce competition for the donor and the donor dollar, 
there's fierce competition for people to serve on your board. So the more you can project a winning organization, uh, the more you can project a winning organization, uh, the more likelihood will be uh, recruiting them. Now, let's turn to the issue, uh, and we'll address questions you have on recruitment. So let's turn to the issue of board reappointment. Uh, many of you um, may uh, oh, go back for a second. I'm sorry, go back. Nope, go forward. There we go. Let's stay there. Okay. Um, one of the major responsibilities of the governance committee that we talked about earlier is a process in place to evaluate individual members' performance prior to rewarding them with a new term. Now, we'll get into term limits a little bit later if that's an issue for you. But in order to really become a high performing organization, uh, boards must continually evaluate each member's performance and make the difficult decision whether to reappoint them or not. Uh, that can be challenging for a lot of people. Now, the way I would recommend this is that a process should begin during the recruitment and orientation process by explaining to each new board member what is expected of them. That can come from your board chair, your chair of your Governance committee, it can come from your CEO or a combination of things. Um, and but clearly, every no one should come on to the board without understanding what's expected of them. And I don't mean expected of them just in terms of a financial contribution, but how you want them and how you need them to help you become a better organization and become a better board. Um, it should be an ongoing conversation. Uh, it should never be a surprise to anybody when a decision is made by a governance committee not to reappoint someone to the board, okay? If your board does not have a reappointment process today, which includes a fact-based evaluation of individual performance against expectations, one should be developed. So here's how would I recommend to you going about uh, putting together a... Um, a reappointment process. Well, certainly, I, you can certainly have a written job description or certainly an outline of key roles and responsibilities. Uh, many of that will include things like um, meeting attendance, how often if your board meets, say, monthly or every other month or whatever, what's expected. And we all have family and business and, and other things that sometimes can interfere our health. Uh, but certainly a reasonable 75 to 80% of meetings should be a requirement. Uh, certainly every board member, if you have a committee structure, sometimes you've got a board of five people, you're not going to have committees, which is fine if you're a small board or a large board is going to have a committee structure. Everybody should serve at least on one committee. Um, clearly, um, are they functioning as a goodwill ambassador in your community? Uh, are they, do they show your organization on their LinkedIn profile? Do they proudly uh, you know, let people know in their business world and cultivation events that they're on your board here? Do you, do you show on your website who's serving on your board? I, I, think it's a, I think it's a key thing to do. I think sometimes we make mistakes by not doing that, but I think it's important to show who your members of your board are um certainly uh as a board member you want them helping you cultivate and perhaps even help solicit uh gifts on a, either uh, on an annual basis or an annual fund or a campaign or whatever that should be mentioned up front uh, as well as perhaps making a financial contribution subject to the means here but you should have some type of uh criteria for reappointment and so when, whether it's a two-year term or a three-year term, whatever it is, or a one-year term, um, clearly it should be discussed amongst your board governance committee um, with the person about have they met the criteria. Another thing that I would recommend here, as it's listed here, is a self-evaluation. Create a self-evaluation tools, we have those, um, where board members can, can rank themselves here. How did they, um, do they enjoy being on the board? One of the questions that I ask all the time when in my work with assessing boards' performances is, hey, are you, how long have you been on the board and have you been on other nonprofit boards? Because many times this is the first time for people. 
Um, and I ask him up front, is, you know, do you like being on the board and why? Uh, most people do, um, but it's, it's important to get a sense of where they're at. And again, I don't think this should be waiting to the end of a term to have a discussion about if someone's not showing up and everything, but I think that's sort of important here. So the two um, big features for today's webinar is uh, reappointment um, and, and recruitment here. And, and next slide, Michelle. Uh, let's, just, let's go back one more time. So let's go back one more time. I think the, the, the key here, the people, are they passionate? Are they enthusiastic? And are they motivated? When I see people on boards for 25 years, 40 years, 30 years, or whatever, or even two years, if their passion is gone, um, and if their enthusiasm is gone, they likely will bring everybody else down with them. And I think the uh, important for the conversation uh, about reappointment should always come from the board chair or the chair of the governance committee. I do not think it's the role for the CEO, it's just my opinion, to be talking to board members about whether they're being reappointed or not. It'll come back and bite you in the butt. So let's summarize here a little bit. Uh, in terms of recruitment, and I know all of you are looking for board members, before you start saying, I need, you know, I need someone that knows finance or they can have a treasurer. I need someone that knows clinical care. I need someone that knows social media. Before you get to the technical skills or skills, which you learn on the job, the slow skills, um, suggestion, focus first on the personal attributes and, and then obviously the characteristics of the person. And then based upon that priority, match up skills. Uh, we're going to be taking questions here in a second here. Um, I also want to talk about, if I can, next the uh, our next uh, webinar will be coming up, I guess, in two weeks here. Uh, would your board members rather have a root canal than help with raising money? And I'll be talking about the, the transition from the tin cup to the investment area of philanthropy. And I think most people can relate to whether your board would rather have a root canal or stick pins in the rise and raise money. And we can we can. This webinar, I think, will certainly help you understand that process, the emotional uh, reasons behind that. I also want to let you know, next slide, Michelle, if I can, is that um, one of the things that we have, that we're rolling out is uh, a, our new online course. Uh, we have another one coming out in about four to six weeks on executive leadership of high performance, but how to become a high performing nonprofit board is an online course that we have um, that, Board members can take this at their home, in their office, on, the, on their laptop, on their phone, whatever. Um, it has a number of modules. It has a course workbook. Um, the course itself is an intense one hour, but people are using it uh, throughout the year for discussion topics on educating the board governance. They're using the course for board orientation of new members coming in. They're using it for discussion for retreats. Um, and there's a whole range of topics. Let's move to the next one we have here. Here's an example of the topics that we're covering in the course. Um, and obviously recruitment is a key part of that. But, but as I said earlier, um, you, the more you can talk about the achievements of your organization when you're meeting with people, the more you can talk about the impact you're having in your community, the more you can create a sense of pride and, and, and of success, the more likely you will be to having people join your board. The course deals with uh, characteristics of high-performing boards, the obstacles to those uh, performance issues, the responsibilities and roles of the chair, uh, what characterizes a um, nonprofit board, um, uh, board leadership succession, which is an issue for many of you. We just talked about recruitment and reappointment and best practices, uh, the board and CEO relationship. Uh, we're gonna we talk about the executive leadership competencies that are needed today by boards compared to yesterday how to create an inspiring vision, uh, how to increase what I jokingly call the non-public stock price, uh, how to successfully build a fundraising organization, how to address difficult board behavior, which can be certainly part of a reappointment process if all else fails, you just don't reappoint the person. And then last but not least, and I think this is one of our uh, 
fourth webinars of the fall season is measuring and evaluating the board's annual performance. I also want to let each of you know that if you have a particular question that you would like to ask me in private, I would ask you to email me at dennis at dennis c as in charles miller.com. I am happy to schedule a, a brief conference call with you or a board member of your board or CEO about a particular issue you have as a courtesy. Um, I, you can see there, Michelle's great at making sure everybody knows about the books I've written. Uh, the first one is, uh, looks like a very professorial here, uh, A Guide to Achieving New Heights, The Four Pillars of Successful Nonprofit Leadership. Uh, my second book is A Nonprofit Boy Therapist, uh, A Guide to Unlocking Your Organization's True Potential, and there deals a lot with board governance and recruitment. Uh, certainly, The Power of Strategic Alignment, which I find um, just as sometimes you and I are, feels our body's out of alignment and our back hurts and our mind's not good and our car is out of alignment and our tires wear out, oftentimes organizations, I find, are out of alignment in terms of achieving their vision. Uh, my autobiography, Mountain Floor as a CEO, and my newest book, A Guide to Recruiting Your Next CEO, The Executive Rich Handbook. So again, I thank you for participating today. Uh, I hope that you have um, enjoyed or benefited from this. And it's time, Michelle, to begin taking questions from our listeners or attendees. Hi, can you all hear me? Uh, yes, a slideshow will be made available. Um, Dennis, there's uh, one, a couple of questions up here. Uh, one is, don't some boards have separate bylaws committees? and also legal committees to review the bylaws as well. Yeah, some do. I don't think it's necessary. I think it's an overdue. I think that I would suggest, listen, I see boards that I work with. I've, I've worked with literally, uh, fortunately, hundreds of boards around the country. So I see bylaw committees. I see nominating committees. I see all kinds. Uh, all this bylaws, now, it's one thing to have a, and it's a great question, by the way. It's one thing if you... Uh, want to have a small group of people uh, with expertise in, in, in law or bylaws and want to have a task force, like look at it annually. I'm fine with that. That's not a problem. However, a committee just for bylaws is kind of like, um, I don't know, Michelle, sort of like a hot oh, well, mustard. I, I don't know, maybe I should stop my humor here. Um, I think that the bylaws should be part of a governance committee review and, uh, and I think that's where I'll leave it. Next question if we got. Um, what are your thoughts on term limits? Okay, a couple things here. Let's deal with term limits here. It's a touchy subject for everybody here. In the ideal world that none of us live in, in the ideal world, we wouldn't need term limits because anybody who has felt that they've given their contribution, they've given their time and energy, they've helped you move forward in your organization and adjust, they're kind of done. Um, they would know themselves to say, listen, I, I, I really have enjoyed being here, but it's time for let me, someone else come on the board. And or it's when a board chair or board president, I use the term chair, but when the board chair um, can say to me or you or anybody, I noticed, listen, you know, John or Jane, listen, I noticed, you know, you just have a conversation, a cup of coffee, and I noticed you're not coming to the board meetings a lot. Is things going on? Is it? But sometimes people just want a phone call or a conversation so they can get it out here. So in the ideal world, you wouldn't need term limits. However, because people don't self-deploy or self-reject off the board when their passion is done with a few exceptions, and when board chairs don't like to, to touch the subject of not reappointing people because they're either business friends or colleagues or their wives know each other, et cetera. So I think term limits are very important. How long a term should be? There's two things. There's a term, which I think probably on average should be two years. It could be three years. Um, at sometimes three years is probably appropriate because Honestly, it's like going on vacation. If you go on Sunday to Saturday, by Wednesday, you're relaxing, and now you got to pack. So I think three years is a fair term. How many of those terms? Some organizations have two, three-year terms. Some have three terms. I don't think, per se, people should be on the board probably longer than 10 years. I know there's the issue of, um, and it comes up in our course, 
and it comes up in my work about how those one or two just really shining stars, how do you keep involved? And there's nothing to preclude a former board member from perhaps chairing your governance committee. There's nothing perhaps having them part of your advisory board or part of a board committee. But I think overall terms should be for a couple of years and probably a limit of two to three terms. Next question, Michelle. Is there a standard of how frequently a board governance committee should meet? Yeah, no. I, I think on average, the governance committee probably meets quarterly. I think that's a fair time, quarterly. Now, again, depends upon where you are in your life cycle or stage of governance as an organization. If you are just getting going, um, then governance is an important issue and you may need to meet with, you know, biweekly. However, as a whole, on organizations that are sustaining themselves and are moving forward here, I think kind of uh, quarterly is probably the on the average. I don't think the, the governance committee clearly does not need to meet monthly. Doesn't mean the work doesn't get done in between meetings, but I think towards recruitment, planning for retreats, uh, board education, that's an ongoing thing. But from a committee point of view, I think four times a year is probably on average of what I say. Uh, another question, you've kind of addressed some of this. Um, what are your thoughts on board chair emeritus status and ongoing involvement in boards? Okay. I think a couple things here. Um, I think it's really important to, and this really deals with a couple of things, but it deals with certainly recruiting board members because, and retaining board members, but getting the board chair, which was our previous webinar. I, I think board chairs should be recognized and, and rewarded in whatever way you can. In some places that you can, you know, sort of a chair, chairperson's club or, you know, uh, things like that, they automatically get your newsletters or whatever, uh, invited to your galas and everything. I, I don't have a problem per se with chairman emeritus status, however, I remember um, asking my former board chair at a board meeting when I was in my medical center career, and his name was uh, was Jim, and he was a physician. And I remember saying, hey, "Jim, how do you feel about being on the board? You know, now because it's awkward. I just served, you know, board chairs, whatever I did, two or three years, and now, you know, people want to change things, and I don't know if they feel comfortable with me here. So, I don't think." I think it's appropriate to reward board chairs with some capacity. If someone's been the founder and been around for 25 years uh, and widely regarded in the community as an asset and a high range personality, I don't have a problem with making someone chairman emeritus. However, having the previous chair involved in current governance matters can kind of or will undermine your current board chair. And I think you gotta be careful of that. So I hope that answers that question. Okay, well, continuing on the uh, idea of awkward situations, um, a question comes up, how would one approach their board to discuss the fact that the current vice president is not as capable as one would hope to step up as the next uh, chair of the board or president of the board? It's a great question, and I believe this sincerely. Now, I know there's, you know, um, we work with obviously, you know, lots of nonprofit boards, but that includes trade association boards and chambers of commerce and things like that. And sometimes, you know, they're like, you know, the, the chair, they're like they call them the chairs, your secretary, treasurer, vice chair, president. I, and I have the experience with this personally, I think that nobody who's vice president of the board or vice chair of the board should not automatically be given a tag that says you are the next chair. I have seen people who are phenomenal board members. And I had this experience, I'm not gonna mention any names obviously, but I had experience with many good board members and a really good vice chair of the board, very forward thinking person, um, high energy, passion, very strategic thinking. Before, this person finished up his or her term as vice chair, they had lost their position or was asked to retire or whatever happened in the corporate world and they became a different person. And they 
uh, just were not there. And I, I'm almost like saying mentally, just they they were distracted. And they, um, that passion, that well thought out person was not there. So I think this is the role of the governance committee. This is why governance committee, you know, is so important of a committee. Um, I know the other committees are important. I know finance and audit, and I, I know there's other committees of, you know, strategic development I'd like to see and, and human resources compensation and a range of things like that and, and programs and all that stuff. I think they're obviously important work here. I um, think that the governance committee should be getting input um, from self-evaluation tools and from a board uh, evaluation tool and it's beyond the scope of our webinar today. I'm not a believer that just in just using a questionnaire as to measure board performance, I don't think you get to the heart of the matter. I do think you need to have someone either, if you have someone trained internally, externally, asking um, open-ended questions, honest open-ended questions about, do you, do you think that, uh, what's your opinion about having, you think Jane or Joe is ready to be the next chair? I think you have those questions. So you never want to appoint someone to be the chair that everybody feels, or majority feel, is not ready. Any other, next question, Michelle, if you ready. Uh, oh, okay, this just popped up. Uh, do you have a sample board evaluation that you can share? Uh, yes, uh, yeah, I think, uh, we can, um, the answer is, uh, uh, as a courtesy, uh, if they email me, I will be happy to um, share a list of a survey tool that we use, yes. I'm typing your email address. Dennis, there's one question that comes up um, that I hear a lot, uh, and I sometimes struggle to answer, especially for new organizations. What, how many board members should an organization have? Good question. Well, here's my, 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 my little saying, Michelle, small boards want to be bigger and bigger boards want to be smaller. <laughs> it's just true. I'm sorry about that. But, but here's what I, I think here. Um, clearly, a $500,000 operation and a $5 million operation may be different than a $100 million operation or larger or billion dollar operation. On average, on average, the average size of a board, on average, is 12 to 15. Now, 18 is normal and not unusual. Uh, 10, some people, because they struggle to get board members and they struggle for a lot of reasons. And when you struggle to get board members, uh, and I'm sure if everybody who's on the call and everybody else was just honest, it, it's not the only thing you're struggling with, which is why I'm being an advocate for becoming a high performing board because it, it's a cure of all ills here. So I think um, sort of that 12, 15, 12 to 18 kind of maximum. I think that's kind of, uh, now, if you're a foundation board, uh, if, you're a tr if you're a trade association board, it can be a little different because it's almost like anybody that pays significant dues wants to be on the board. And what happens there occasionally is that you could have a board of 50 people or 25 people on the board of a foundation but you could have a 12 to 15 person governance committee or executive committee um, that does a lot of the work. Now, we're, we're getting at it off the, the topic here, but I, I, I want to speak about the executive. But I, I think that's kind of the number here. The, um, but it can, again, you've got to look at what's right for you, your organization, where you are in your lifestyle, your size. And remember, in spite of all the stuff that's written, all the books that's written, including books about from me and everything else here, and the work that I've done with boards around the country, and besides the legal reasons, I always tell people, remind yourself, the, the, the reason you have a board, it's legally required. But besides that, the only way I know of for a CEO and his or her executive team to reach their full potential is to have a board that helps you play on an active role. Now, I'm going to mention this here a little bit. We talked about this in our other work here. Besides the role of the fiduciary responsibility and the strategic business role, you want your board to take on a mature role of one of governance, the leadership, a partnership. And it's beyond the scope of our discussion here today. We talked about, I think, the previous webinar. We're happy to forward that recorded webinar to you if you would let us know. Um, so, Michelle, my answer is uh, I'd be, you know, I think 12 to 15 is probably the right size. Okay.
Um, that's uh, all I'm seeing as far as questions go. Um, and I did send out, Dennis, your email address uh, in case anybody has further questions after this session. Absolutely, and I want, uh, and also we'll get the recording out to you. And please uh, sign up um, to uh, our next webinar, and we'll be shortly getting back to you with how to um, uh, enroll and register for our course for your board members. That's it's a license for a year, um, ongoing training without recording needing any airlines or hotel reservations or conference fees. So, again, we thank you all very much, and have a great uh, day, and uh, and. Uh, Godspeed and good luck in continuing the work you do uh, around the country. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone.